Good morning. As everybody's getting settled, I'll try again. Good morning. As usual, it's a, another beautiful day in Montrose, Colorado. And uh, we just want to welcome everybody for coming this morning. For those watching online, thank you for visiting with us this morning. Um, for those in the congregation, we miss you and love you and look forward to a time when we're all back together. Now, uh, this morning we have a couple of announcements. I want to talk about the Prayer Fest group meeting uh, twice this Thursday, March 25th. This is a wonderful time for prayer in our community. It's hosted by uh, several different community churches, and this month it's hosted here at First Prez. Um, there are two times to meet, one at 7 a.m. and one at 5.30. That way, if you're on your way to work in the morning and you want to stop, you can stop in the morning or in the afternoon after work. Uh, it's about 30 minutes, and we just pray uh, about our community and needs there. Uh, the pastor nominating committee, um, as much of an update as we can give, we are continuing our work. We just wanted everyone to know that and be aware. Um, as our session discerns the uh, future for our congregation, the PNC is continuing to do the work. We covet your prayers. Please continue to pray for us, a pastor for this church, as well as for the session and their decisions there. Uh, I wanted to say thank you for our um, youth-led praise team this morning. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you, Zach, um, for your involvement here. And uh, hope we all have a happy Sunday. Thanks. If you would stand and join us in worship.
play this next song, I would encourage you guys to uh, reflect on the words of the song and let it lead you to confession. First John 2, 1 through 2 says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone, anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world.
Join me in prayer over the offering. Lord, I pray that whatever is given, uh, whether it be time, talents, or financial aid, that it will be used to better and to grow your kingdom. I pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you guys. It's a great way to start our morning and prepare our hearts for worship. It's awesome. So, good morning. Uh, my name is Zach. If we haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I'm the youth guy here, and I'm thankful to get to uh, speak with you guys this morning. Um, so, as I was preparing uh, this message, um, I'll have to admit I had a bit of a slip up at first. So we have this, 
from our team. We have this great Excel doc that we put everything together in on, and everyone who's speaking puts like the verses they're using, they're putting their notes in there and everything, and I just happened to not check that out for a couple days or so, and we were sitting in worship last week, and Merle was talking right on what I was planning to do, um, which it's all good. Um, that's on me, of course, for not checking it out. Um, but I just figured that was God saying like, oh, that's not what I want you to speak on. So that's okay. I'm sure Merle did better justice to it than I could have ever anyway. So I'm thankful for that. Um, but as I went back and the, the, the kind of sad thing in that is I'm quite a procrastinator myself, I'll admit. And I was actually close to ready about a week ahead of time, which is very, very rare for me on something like that. So I'm like, dang, but now I got one in my back pocket, save for next time, I guess. Um, but as I went back and was praying about it and trying to think through, like, what should I talk about then? God, what do you want me to talk about? And I know we're in Lent. We're two weeks away from Easter, like, working. Jesus is on his way to the... Whoa, Jason. Wow. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, but we're, we're on our way to the cross with Jesus. Um, and so I'm reading, I'm praying, where should I be in that? And as I was going through some of the gospel accounts, I got to one point that I'm like, oh yeah, that, that's it. It's like it's become one of my, um, in recent years, one of my favorite like stories and Jesus is journey to the cross. So I'm excited to get to share that with you this morning. But before we jump in, let's pray. God, I thank for this day, and I thank you for everybody here that we could come together and worship you. And I just pray that all we give this morning, all of our worship, that it be pleasing to you, that um, we just give thanks to you and all of it. I pray as um, we give this message, Lord, that um, it be of you that I'm just your messenger here, and that's it, Lord. And if there's anything of my own, that it would just fall on deaf ears here this morning. But I pray um, that your spirit move in us, open our hearts to receive and our ears to hear what it is you have prepared for us. And this is all in your name. Amen. All right, so we're going to look at Matthew 27. And before we jump in there, I'll just go a little backstory to where we're at at this point in the story. So up to this point, as Merle talked about last week, they had the Last Supper and everything. We've had the Last Supper already. Um, Jesus has already been in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying. He knows what's coming. He's known what's coming for a while now, but it's getting real at this point. He's, he's in Jerusalem. Like, this is just days away. And so he's in the Garden of Gethsemane praying for another way. He's stressed out. He's terrified, but he chooses to be obedient. And while he's there, um, he's arrested and betrayed and by one of his closest followers, Judas. So they come in the middle of the night because they're afraid of what would happen if they came in day. And they arrest Jesus, they take him off. Uh, and he's taken before the Sanhedrin at that point, and that's the chief priests, the Jewish leaders, the elders. Um, and there he's questioned and pretty much um, interrogate, interrogated before them. And, and it was enough to question Jesus, but well, let alone all of that, they then proceed to beat him and literally spit in his face Following that, we get the account of Peter, again, one of his closest disciples, if not the closest, possibly, um, denies Jesus three times. He denies knowing him, being with him, and everything. And Jesus knows all of this. And from there, Judas goes, bought land with the money he was given from turning Jesus over, betraying him, and hangs himself on that property from all the guilt and shame and everything he felt at that time. And so he's working his way to the cross and he's clearly already gone through 
quite a bit at this point, more than any good, let alone perfect, being person deserves at this point. And finally, we arrive at our passage for today, um, which is Matthew 27, 11 through 6. And if my pages will get unstuck, I can go. All right, so jumping in at verse 11. It says, Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. Different guy. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who's called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. When Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who's called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When, the Pilate, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. So here we get to meet a little bit Barabbas. And we look, if we look further at the gospel account of Mark and John, um, we learn a bit more about this Barabbas. And so it tells us that he was a murderer and a robber. He was a leader of an insurrection. Um, he was a notorious criminal, and being notorious for anything back in that day was quite an accomplishment in itself in some sense, I guess, because when you think about it, they didn't have news, they didn't have any papers, social media. It was so for everyone to know your name and who you were and to be known as a notorious criminal, you had to be a pretty bad dude, right? And so what we see from Barabbas as he enters the story is that Jesus is going to be pitted up against him here. And in line with the Jewish custom um, at the Passover festival, um, Pilate was to release a a prisoner um, at this time to them, and they got to choose who. And so we get this image of sinless and perfect Jesus pitted up against the notorious, well-known criminal and murderer Barabbas. And so Pilate gives it to the crowd to decide, as he did, and he, he says to them, like, who do you want, Barabbas the thug or Jesus the Messiah? And so much evil in their hearts, the chief priest at his time, he, persuade the crowd to go a certain way. And so Pilate asks again, like, what do you, who do you want me to release? And Barabbas, they say, they call for Barabbas. We want Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. And at that point, what they're doing is they're calling for Jesus to be executed. And so no further questioning from Pilate um, at this point of what crime has he committed, though? Like, this is an innocent man. You're choosing Barabbas. Nothing he says at this point is changing their minds. Like, their hearts are just so turned in that direction against them. 
They want him executed. And so Pilate releases Barabbas to them. And that's the last we see of Barabbas. Really, we don't hear anything from him there. We don't see him pop up later on in the story. There's literally no other mention of him at this point. But so we see they chose to release the worst of the worst bad dude over a completely innocent man at this point. And so Barabbas, the thug, the murderer, the leader of the insurrection, is free to go. And instead, the one who deserves the, and so the one deserving the chains, who deserves the beatings, the mockery, so much of what Jesus has already gone through and is about to even go through even more, the death, the crucifixion on a cross, Barabbas is now free. None of that seems to make too much sense to me. As you see here, Jesus is good. I mean, he's the one who heals the sick and raises the dead to life. And he performs miracles and he makes the blind see and the deaf hear. He gives freedom and life to those who have never had it or experienced it or given it. And this guy who just takes life instead is the one who gets to go and walk away. It's like, how is that happening? And all like, how evil do they have to be in their hearts to see this and cheer for this and want this and plead for this, really? And so generally, when I've read this account in the Gospels of Jesus up before Pilate, like, that's what I've really gotten out of the story and whatnot is it's kind of been like just a passing moment to me as on his way to the cross, just to highlight more so, like how undeserving he was. Once again, how evil their hearts were and how turned against him they were. Uh, it's a significant point, but it didn't go that much deeper for me um, until recent, really. And so that might not be you, um, but that's kind of what I've gotten out of this for quite some time. Um, but I want to circle back in the story, though, and just look a little further, look a little closer at Barabbas himself. Because, uh, because although, like, once Pilate releases him, we never see him again, doesn't say anything, I think most of us actually probably know Barabbas far too well. I think that in itself too it, the fact we d see Barabbas go from here don't meet him ever again he says nothing in this whole situation is one of the sadder parts of this story in my point that in my opinion is once he's released we never hear from him he doesn't express a single sign of gratitude right then he doesn't show any remorse we don't see a man that is just drowning in guilt and shame or anything from the fact that this innocent man, Jesus, who is put up against him is now taking his rightful place, the place he deserves today. And so I think we can assume out of this too and from the whole story is that Barabbas believed it was the people who set him free here. As, as they cheered for him, their pilot asked them, like, who do you want? Who should I give you? And, all, and they cheered Barabbas. We want Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. He, he sees that as the people demanded it, the, that they called for his life to be spared, that, that he's now set free because of them and them f pleading for him, wanting his life instead. And I, I just think he has it so wrong. And in all reality, like, so Jesus, he's on his way to the cross at this point. Jesus had a choice all the way through this and everything. The Father, it's just highlighted throughout this whole gospel story that the Father is in control of everything at this point. So where he thinks the people set him free, I think it was truly Jesus who set him free, actually, it's the love of the Father that set Barabbas free here. Before he even went to the cross, before he died there, before he made a way like that, 
He took Barabbas' rightful spot, and he is allowed to go free at this point, not the people. And so Barabbas, the thug, the murderer, leader of an insurrection, once again, the worst of the worst, a man who showed no gratitude or gratefulness or not thankful one bit, no remorse, nothing good, was set free. I think this is truly Jesus set him free in the first point. And so at this point, some of you might be catching on on where this is going, but if not, I'll lay it out, is that I think we know Barabbas too well sometimes because I'm Barabbas in a story. I think we are Barabbas in this story. Romans 5, 8 says that, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's awesome. But I'm Barabbas. Barabbas clearly did nothing to deserve this here. He deserved that punishment. He did absolutely nothing. I have done nothing to earn this. You have done nothing to earn this. There's nothing we ever could do to earn this, no matter how often we try. I think when the evidence is stacked up against me, come that final judgment day at some point, I'm Barabbas there. I'm going to need an advocate myself, like we just saying, and it's not going to be the people or anything I've done myself. It's someone so much greater than that. It's in his love, before we did anything good, while we were still sinners, that Christ took our place, that he died for us. I'm Barabbas. And on the days that I don't live like his son, when I don't walk in grace and love, when I live ungratefully and in a lack of obedience to him, I'm Barabbas. And every time I think I've earned it, that I'm deserving, that I take praise or anything for myself from others, rather than giving it back and pointing to Christ and looking to him in it, I'm Barabbas. As most everyone knows, and we don't have a slide for it today, but I don't think we need it, because whether you've ever opened a Bible or not, you've probably heard this verse, John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And then he says, God so loved the world, I think it's fair to include in that, because it's part of all the world. God so loved Barabbas, and all our God so loved Gary, even, or God so loved Ben, and all our God so loved, like, your best friend who you've been trying to minister to for years and talk to and be there for, and they just don't get it, and you think they're so dumb at this point. God so loved them and all, or that person who wronged you and you just can't seem to forgive them, like God so loved them. Or simply like just, for God so loved you in this. And so this, this might not fare well if you're hard. We can talk about this after if you happen to be in this category, but if you're very hardcore, five-point Calvinist person. This part might not fare well with you, um, but I believe the truth is that God came down for all. He came for you and for me and for Barabbas. He sent him for those who come to love them. I think he even came for Barabbas, the one he knew who would walk away, never accept him, never listen to him, and would have no gratitude to him. He came because he loved all of them. God loves Barabbas, and thank God for that, because I'm far too often like Barabbas. I think for some time now, in some church settings, um, the church has gotten into a bad habit of identifying ourselves 
in the wrong part of the story when we read it a lot. We really like to find ourselves in the hero spot. I mean, I can think back to Sunday school as a kid, and we're being taught, and there's all these great skits about David and Goliath and everything, and being told, like, you're David, like, be like David and everything, and like, that's great, I want to be, but the reality is, I'm often, we are very often, most always, the scared Israelites in the back, and, you know, sometimes there's is Goliath and all people that just defile and stand in the face of God and everything. So when we read this story, don't get confused here. It's like we are Barabbas in it. We, you know, you might be in the crowd sometimes cheering against it. And that's where a lot of the world is and whatnot. But we're, we're not Jesus in this story and all. We're not David in that one. We're not the hero ever. So although we, we find ourselves as Barabbas in a story, the, the amazing thing, and thanks to his grace, is we don't have to respond like Barabbas, though. I mean, we, look, we talked about all he did, and we're going to keep talking about it on his journey to the cross for us, the ridicule, the mockery, the beatings, the people literally spitting in his face, his friends denying him and then dying on a cross and rising again. Like he has done so much for you and for me, for all of us. And in that he deserves nothing but our all and that he deserves you and your all. So we, we could go on, and sometimes we do far too often, go on in our days not acknowledging him and what he's done for us, not living as we should, not, not living like we've been saved and what's been done for us, and not loving well, not showing grace, or not, even, not sharing it, not being ministers of this word and these great news. We can find ourselves there a lot, and we can know, and you can ignore it if you want, but that's not right. That doesn't add up to me. It's not how you say thanks or repay someone for something so amazing to you. But our day should be characterized by devotion and gratitude and obedience and seeking to glorify him for all that he's done and all of this. This Again, thank God for his free gift of grace which was given to us while we were still sinners. That's the most beautiful thing in the world to me. He just deserves it all. Let me pray. God, thank you for this day. And and I thank you for your word. I thank you for your grace and the gift of your son and what he has done for us, Lord. And I just thank you that you've made a way, God, that it doesn't rely on us. And I just pray as we go from here today and as we live out our lives and be in relationship with others, God, that we are your light, um, that we live in response to all you have done for us, that we just our lives would be characterized by obedience and thankfulness to you and what you have done and um, that that would show uh, greater from us, through us than anything else we can put forth, Lord. This is all in your name. Amen. Sweet. So we are going to go into a time of prayer once again, as we have. Um, If you guys want to come grab mics. Uh... I think it's so great that we get to pray and devote some time in our services to this together because it's an essential part of worship. And I think through prayer, we get to know each other's hearts and what's on our hearts. Um, So yeah, and so these, Gary and Katie, will have mics, and I just ask you to speak into the mic so people at home watching online can hear you. It doesn't really pick up well without the mic. Um, But also, if you would just like, if you have a prayer request, share that and introduce yourselves for people here who might not know you or anything. So, any prayer requests today? 
We got two. <laughs> I'm Dave Baldwin. We need to pray for Glenn Henshaw. Mm -hmm. Carol Pyle and uh, Jerry is in Arizona right now with his, sorry, helping his son whose wife is dying wow. and she's at home on hospice and Jerry will be staying in the home while Lance goes back to work. Her name is Marsha, so I ask for prayers for all three of them, Jerry, Marsha, and Lance, during this difficult time for peace and comfort. Thank you. Yeah. Any other prayer requests? Merle Beerman, two things. <clears throat> Our session needs prayer for some tough decisions they've got to make. And we also have to pray for our PNC as they look for a new pastor. Hmm. All right, if there's nothing else, oh, great. Spoke too soon. Uh, Tom Cheney, we need to continue to pray for Bob Stadler in Denver. As my understanding is condition is worsened. And for Donna, his wife. Hmm. Marge Birma, um, I just want to pray that so many times people come to church during this time of year and it's just a one time of occasion. I pray that it change hearts and that people come to know what the real meaning of Easter is all about. Lexi Stevenson, and we want to pray for Joseph Sharman, who's had a, um, a diagnosis and he's awaiting treatment and we'd like to pray for his peace and for Don and Sue and the entire family as they go through this with Joseph. We pray for God's blessings on Joseph and his healing powers. Yeah, Ron Henderson. Uh, we need to pray for our country, for clarity through these seeming times of confusion and that we adhere and, and cling to our rock. Uh, we need to pray for our state, similarly oriented, and uh, our county as well as our church. All right, I think those are some great things to pray about, so if you would bow your heads with me. God, we uh, come to you today as your people gather together with so much on our hearts, so much um, worry and concerns and hurting and pain, Lord. I just want to lift it all up to you, God for loved ones and friends and members of this congregation that are at home recovering and are sick. Lord, I pray you just bring peace and healing and comfort, Lord. Um, in times of passing, Lord, I pray that um, you bring the same, that you be there with them, that they feel your presence and, and they know you, Lord, and that man, they just feel Feel your love in this time, Lord. I pray for, for our leaders here at our church. God, I pray that you would guide them and lead them well. and They would seek after you and service um, to your church body, Lord. I pray for our session with that. And I pray for our PNC with their search as well, that um, 
No, you have us in this season for a reason that you're preparing us for something. And although it can often feel like we're in the desert, we know you're up to work in it, Lord, and you know you're guiding the way. And I just pray that whoever it is and whenever it is, um, you have a plan to bring us a, a pastor, a leader, a shepherd, Lord, that um, we know you are preparing us right now in ways that we don't even know for them, and you're preparing them as well just to lead us and love us and help us serve um, your world well, Lord. I pray for um, just the leaders of as he said, our country, our world, our county, our city. Lord, I, I pray that you be with them, that you lead them, that you guide them. Um, I pray that they would seek after you, Lord, in service to your people everywhere, Lord. Um, yes. And just pray over all those things, Lord. And we pray in this, this season we're in, as in this Easter season, Lord, uh, as Marge said, so many people just come to church this one time of year, Lord, or once, maybe another time too, Lord. And I just pray that as they come, Lord, they would truly meet you. They would hear from you and see what this is about, what following you truly is and what it's like and what it means for them. Um, I pray that all of us here would be great examples of that and ministers of that, Lord, that um, we would lead others closer to you, that we would be your example to them as well. And I just pray um, that that same healing, those same miracles you've, you've done in the past and you continue to do, Lord, I pray you do them here now. I pray you turn hearts, you give life, you give hope and love to people that don't know it, Lord. And I thank you that you invite us to be a part of that and what's truly such an amazing, beautiful, and wild ride, and that is our life with you, Lord. As it's all in your name, amen. If you would stand and join us as we sing our last song.
As you go from here, let's pray that you be his hands and his feet, his salt and the light of the world, and know he is madly in love with you, and let's share it. Amen.